just happened in India. Uh, do you think they will be eliminating the fifty and one hundred dollar bills in the U.S.? If so, what are the signs to look for prior to that occurrence? Uh, what was India and now Turkey, or what what was India about and now Turkey telling its citizens to buy gold or its national currency? Well, the hints for removing the big dollar denominations. By the way, I have had in my hot little hands two different $1,000 bills. Mm. Uh, that was back when I was doing, how should I say, some contraband activity and commerce mm -hmm. uh, after college, before graduate school. I put it all away. Uh, I went to graduate school and started working real, real hard. And as for the big denomination bills, the 50 and the 100, um, I'm always surprised if I do a withdrawal from a bank and I say, look, I, I need $1,000 to pull out. And they, they sometimes say to me, uh, grandes billetes, mm -hmm. large bills. And I say, yeah, si, si, por favor. Um, or sometimes I say, no, no, billetes de vente, está bien. Um, $20 bills are fine. Um, but they sometimes say to me, are, are, how about 50s, 50s, 50s? And I say, yeah, yeah, you're fine. So they, they end up giving me, say, $800 in hundreds and four $50 bills. And that's a $1,000 withdrawal. Okay, there aren't many 50s out there. And uh, it, it's it's Grant, mm -hmm. Ulysses Grant mm -hmm. on the 50. Uh, I is prefer it, the Benjamins. Is it true? I is it, I'm sorry. Is it true that his middle name is S, the letter S? Ulysses S. Grant, and that he doesn't actually have a full middle name. I don't know. We'll leave that for the listeners in their Google. Continue. I, I think it's true, but I don't know. I don't care. You I've prefer only know the hundo. One, I, I only know. I only know one person who had an initial for a middle name. It was my my buddy Bob, Bob Friedman in the digital days. Robert S. Friedman. What does S stand for? Bob? Nothing. Not even a period after Jim. Look closely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> period means it's, it's an abbreviation. Right? Oh, I get it. Okay, yeah. very good point. Um, okay, here's the hint. Uh, you're out of the U.S., you go to a bank, you do a withdrawal, and they say they don't have any hundreds. Mm -hmm. Why so don't you have any hundreds? So well, we haven't had any hundreds for a while now. Gotcha. There's your hint. Gotcha. Okay. Now, uh, there were many parts to that question. India. Okay, here's what I'm hearing about India, and this is very complex and very difficult to confirm every aspect. Aspect. But... In, in, India is suffering from a couple of problems. One is a big counterfeit problem. If you're going to go to the bother of counterfeiting dollars, are you going to focus on ones and fives, or are you going to focus on hundreds? Obviously the hundreds, yep. Well, the answer to that is a compromise, because the most popular counterfeited bill is the twenty. Hmm. That's what Iran counterfeits. That's what North Korea counterfeits. Is the 20 U.S. dollar bill. The 20 dollar U.S. bill. Yes. yes. Okay, because the 100 is more scrutinized. Mm -hmm. And I notice in the bank, if I do a deposit and I give them hundreds, they spend a few seconds on each bill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I give them 20s, they just kind of count them. Yeah. They might, they might rub their thumb over a, a little... You know, what do you call it? A raised imprint. I wouldn't know. Shit, I can't remember the. There's a there's a name for it. Mm -hmm. The raised. water the watermarks or whatever. No, not the watermark. The ra well, they do, they look for watermarks on the Costa Rican currency. They look they look for the raised engraving. That's it. Ah, okay. The raised engraving. The thumb goes over the lower left corner. Mm -hmm. The thumb grazes the corner and looks and feels that seal that's raised. Okay, that's but they don't do it that much on the twenties. Now, here's what's going on in, in India. They're counterfeiting a lot of money, and it's the big bills. So that's why they eliminated the big bills. It wasn't to make life difficult. It was to cut the legs out from under the counterfeiters. Gotcha. Okay? Now, that's really important. Um, <clears throat> the – so – I haven't followed this 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 Indian situation much. I, I know that it you know they eliminated larger bills. Uh, it, it, it appeared as though there was a run on the banks or a run on cash. You had people lined up, so I assume they were lining up with their fifties and their hundreds, hoping to exchange them before they were going to be deemed 
uh, what contraband? I mean, how, how does that work? Do, do, will your hundred still? I mean, it's it's still money, is it not? Or is it? I guess if it's not, if it's not received, if you can't take it to a bank, I mean, if it's purely a black market bill. Well, it just depends on on the rules. We don't make the rules. Mm-hmm. Um, the second part to this Indian deal is the Pakistanis are moving in a lot of weapons for terrorist type events, blowing up things. Mm marketplaces, temples, you name it. And there's a mix of the two issues. Uh, Pakistanis are involved in some of the counterfeit to buy some of the weapons. Not, and this is not exclusive factors. There are other things involved. Sure, sure. But in, but in, um, hopes, of, in hopes of stopping the, the terror uh, or, or impeding it, I guess. Yes. So the, the Indians are not going to give you full wind uh, that our motives is, are to stop some of the counterfeit done by a lot of te- Pakistanis involved in terrorism. No, no state talks like that. Right. No state wants to discuss in an open forum the the counterfeiting issues. They, they just don't do that. Well, it, it erodes it, it erodes faith in their their fiat system. You know, it's a it, that's a, that's a, what is that the the cardinal rule to a fiat system is you got to have that. Uh, that implied trust. Yeah, well, you know, we don't know much in the United States about the Pakistani versus Indian conflicts. We, we heard a lot about it 20 years ago and 30 years ago, but not in recent years. It has not gone away. Mm-hmm. They don't share the same religion. It's Muslim versus Hindu. Uh, we, don't, we don't get into stuff like that. We don't, we don't worry about that. So, you know, I, I don't have all the answers, but I, I, do, I do believe there's another gold angle to India. Mm-hmm. Um, this is you know, hypothesis. This is conjecture. This is floating up something that needs to be analyzed more fully. But if you're going to be a good analyst, you need, to, you need to put something on the table you're not sure of sometime. Mm-hmm. And look at it closely and look at some of the consequences and ramifications. India might be a test case for seizing gold. They're already seizing it in some temples, the smaller ones. I think I reason it's the ones without a lot of power, a lot without a lot of pull, without a lot of influence. So they're you know, they're they're trying it out. Mm-hmm. They're between fifteen thousand and twenty thousand tons of gold in India. In private stashes for homes. Now, is this jewelry and bullion combined or just bullion? I think it's combined, but there might be, I mean, it might just be the little two ounce, five ounce bars, the half kilogram bar, you know, I, I think little it, bars. It, yeah. We don't deal in bars in the West. Yeah. The East does. Well, and the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the governmental control and regulation of gold, um, we see countries go to jewelry and India is a huge example of that. I mean, they, and it's, you know, you can wear your wealth, you take it with you, nobody steals it when you're not home. That's, you know, sort of the age old, old, old process there. But, uh, I mean, jewel, India, obviously gold jewelry is, is a huge, I mean, you, you see some of these weddings and good Lord, the bride has, you know, a <laughs> quarter million dollars of gold on her, on her body. Um, well, they, 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 they sometimes walk around with three, four five kilograms of gold on their bodies in, at the wedding. Yeah. Okay, but the big deal, though, right now is that India is trying and not having a lot of success to monetize their household gold mm-hmm. because they're having problems with their currency. Mm-hmm. What better way to, to reinforce a currency than with actual physical assets such as gold? So they're, they're offering, they're offering uh, people here, bring in your gold, like, like bring in a kilogram of gold and take a big, big certificate of deposit that earns some interest because right now, Raj, your bar is not earning any interest. You're not getting any income. So bring it into the banking system and earn some income off it. I think India is a test case, and the voice has said emphatically in the last month, India is committing suicide. Modi will be gone before long. The backfire is coming. The response is on its way. Hmm. That's pretty sharp. Yeah. 
I think the experiment's going to fail. Okay, if they wanted to do gold confiscation in the United States, why not try it in India first? Why not? Makes sense. Let's see how it goes. It's a very big population. They want, what are they, 1.3 billion people? Mm -hmm. And they've got 15 to 20,000 tons of gold. So a trial run, and this and India has long been used in these, you know, in these trial runs. Um, I want to uh, take things a little different angle, if you're okay with it, and I'd like to bring. Uh, we've got two questions that fall into our friend. Where in the heck did they go? Our friend Bix's uh, road to root of theory. Um, one from Bix himself, and. Another from Bruce in Florida. So go for it. Go for it. Uh, let's start with Bix. Do you believe that Alan Greenspan secretly wanted to return to a gold standard and was intentionally <laughs> trying to destroy the fiat monetary system by keeping interest rates too low for too long and by removing any regulations on derivatives? So Bix, I wouldn't give. Go ahead. I wouldn't give Greenspan any credit at all. Mm -hmm. I think the guy had an entire banking career that went counter to his entire belief structure in graduate school. And I like to point out, he never earned a doctorate in economics. He got an honorary doctor. Mm -hmm. So I earned my doctorate. Greenspan did not. He was given it at a dinner. Okay? A feel-good dinner. <laughs> Okay, Greenspan, I believe, had a bigger motive. Let's make sure that all my buddies and all of my handlers and bosses can print themselves billion-dollar wealth. Some of it might trickle down to me in the form of speaker fees and book income from publishers. I don't give Greenspan any credit at all. He had a desperate plea in 2001 that people in the United States borrow against their home equity and go out and continue this economy because he was deathly scared the, that the recession that was due in the year 2000 and 2001, following the tech telecom bust, he was deathly afraid that the recession would cause a U.S. government debt default and banking system collapse. Because he, he helped to create the derivatives. The derivatives were re created in the early 1990s. And I believe that was part of Greenspan's watch. Yes, it was. And here's, here's roughly what happened. This is a, a strange sequence and a unique perspective that you don't read about very much. <clears throat> in, in 1984... We started exporting our industrial base. The first one was Intel. We got all kinds of manufacturing going to the big room. Okay, my impression at the time, and I was working at Digital, looking out the window with a couple friends of mine saying, this doesn't look good. The U.S. is going to give up its chip manufacturing, the Pacific Rim of Asia. This is not good. This is legitimate income. And I was told, and I read in, in Barron's, and I read in Wall Street Journal, because we read it every day. I read portions of Wall Street Journal almost every day. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe just a few paragraphs, but sometimes an entire page, depending on the workload. But what we were told was, oh, don't worry, the United States will retain intellectual property ownership, the patents. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. will retain all the distribution rights. And I said, yeah, but distributing something that we don't make can never be really, really prosperous. Mm -hmm. and, and we were told, oh, it's a low-cost solution. We're going to lower the costs, and, and American consumers will have more money in their pockets. And I, that's when I got introduced to putting cash in people's pockets for consumption. And I said, but isn't it better to start a business than to go out and buy a boat? That's when I began getting smart mm -hmm. in economics, the late 80s. Okay, something happened about three or four days later. It was Black Monday of 87. We don't think of Black Monday as being a consequence of offshoring, outsourcing our industry to Asia. It's directly related. Hmm. 
Okay, then something happened. <clears throat> uh, we decided to create the irrational exuberance. Again, it was Greenspan making money easy. Mm -hmm. And he got criticized. Wait a minute. It, it didn't take long for the Dow to go from 3,000 to 4,000, and then even less time to go from four to 5,000. What's going on? Is this good? And he said, well, I just look at it as uh, you know, basically uh, irrational exuberance. Okay, mm -hmm. so he, was, he loved to use the obfuscating verbiage to conceal the fact that he was guilty. Mm -hmm. And I never bought his arguments, ever. When irrational exuberance came in, I thought they're just pumping up the stock market with easy money, and it's finding its way to the markets. They're making it available all over the place. Look at all these zero percent loans you see with, with you know, at the street level for the, the people. And I took advantage of a few of them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. So what followed that? Um, tech Telecom bust of 2000. What followed that? The subprime mortgage bust. Yep. What followed that? QE and 0%. Bubble after that? bubble after bubble. After bubble. We're, we're on a sequence of bubbles, and they all began with Greenspan. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you got to look at the origin, and people say, well, Jim, it, the problem is not Black Monday and, and exporting industry in 84. you got to look earlier than that. I say, well, of course. You can look back to 71 when we got off the gold standard. And I say, yeah, yeah, you can look even earlier. You can go to 60, 63 when they killed Kennedy. Yeah, okay, well, fine. You can always – oh, yeah, you can always go back to 1913 when they created the Fed. Mm -hmm. All right, well, fine. You can always trace back. You can go back to the birth dates and locations of the Fed owners. I don't care to do that exercise. I look at the sequence of bubbles yeah. and how we've never really endured a, a, a recession that we've admitted – since the Clinton administration, right, everything's Since, been been papered over, and now it's it's. I mean, look at the look at the metrics now. We're in the mother of of bubbles of all bubbles. Well, the, those that that believe in Obix that believe this is that uh, Alan Greenspan did this by design. You know, being a gold bug uh, formerly under Reagan, uh, and that 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 he saw where this was going, and with the with the with the birth of financial computing intentionally did this by design so that the bankers would, would give themselves more than enough rope to hang themselves and then we would go back to a gold standard, which ties into the second question uh, in Bruce from Florida. Uh, does the USA have tons of gold uh, in above ground storage to back a new gold based dollar? Does the USA indeed have deep stored gold in ground in Chocolate Mountain, California? Do huge in ground gold uh, exist in the Grand Canyon, Arizona, first reported in the New York Times in 1912, and then never again. Um, what, what are your thoughts there on, on massive hidden secret gold reserves within the U.S. to transition to a gold-backed note after this chaos is over? Bullshit! <laughs> <laughs> One word. You really, think, you really think the U.S. elite, after stealing the gold, are going to make it available to prevent a crisis that they want to cause. So your so your yeah your your answer is if the we're, gold we're is the there, Empire. why wouldn't they have stole stolen it already? No, they already stole it. They're not going to make it available. They stole it. They stole it. If you steal something, are you going to make it available to your host? No, you used it. Why'd you steal it? Because you needed it. You wanted it. You're going to give it back? No one gives it back from the elite. No one ever gives it back. The only thing I can conceive of is the Bush family and the Rockefellers are going to come forward and say, we can help finance the gold for a gold-backed dollar, but we want the following three things. We want to be able to control the important cabinet positions. We want to assure that there will always be a war. And we want you never to prosecute anybody in our organization. And that's possible. But are there giant hordes just lying around waiting to help and save the nation? No. These people are trying to destroy the nation. Right. They want the chaos. We're the empire of chaos, and the Langley folks are the orchestrators of destabilization. Mm -hmm. Do you think they're going to bring in the gold to stop the destabilization? You've got to think this through. That's not what they're about. No. They're about chaos, murder, power, control, destabilization, 
and they love killing people. Yeah. I think they want martial law so they can kill a lot of people on the streets and try out some nifty new weapons. Mm -hmm. One of the motives for the Vietnam War was to try out a lot of nifty new weapons. Like Agent Orange. I'll never forget the story of General Elmo Zumwalt, whose son died of cancer from Agent Orange because he was exposed to it as a grunt troop, mm -hmm. a, a grunt soldier. This is, this is nasty business. Don't ever assume the elite have good intentions. Well, I think the assumption is certainly not that. I think that in this, in this argument is that uh, these gold hordes would, be, would exist and be controlled by you know, the, the forces of good that, uh, that are there that may be trying to take this cabal down. Uh, but again, to your point, if, the, if those gold hordes were there, the cabal who is, I mean, quite obviously in control of just about everything, they're still spraying out of airplanes uh, and poisoning us all, they probably would have, would have to taken the gold. They're certainly not going to put up their own stolen gold. Um, and I don't think the arguers of this theory are, are suggesting that. I think it's something, you know, even deeper. But uh... Let me give you a little side story about bush gold, mm -hmm. okay? Okay, Bush is a big thief of gold. I believe the Bushes own the, the Libyan gold. It's 144 tons. That's never, never in the news. Uh, Gaddafi was not a bad guy. Right. He just he's got in our way. If you look at the history of Arabs, history of Arab leaders, and look at their accomplishments, like for building water systems, building schools, mm -hmm. increasing educational level, uh, promoting small business. Gaddafi is probably the top of the list. Yeah, that's what I've heard. But then again, if you look to see who's most vilified, it's Gaddafi mm -hmm. because he wanted to institute the gold dinar. Okay, yeah. there's a lot. Okay, but here's the little side story about the Bush gold. Uh, the, the Voice told me this story back in 2014. Um, I remember the date. This is kind of funny. I, I mention it from time to time. I remember what window I was looking out from my office when having the conversation with The Voice. I was in a certain building, and I was at that floor, that building, 2014. So that's how I date some things. It's kind of fun. It's curious how, how that how memories work. Oh, I was living with Dolores next door when I was six. Okay, you remember things that way, points of reference. He told me in 2014 that, the, that there are seven major global gold vaults. Major, major gold vaults. And, and uh, the Bushes use a couple. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, Jim, we're having all – remember back then, 2014, the big issue was rehypothecation? Mm-hmm. Uh, the gold, the Germans are asking for their gold back. The the, uh, the Dutch and the Austrians are looking for theirs too. Why aren't they getting their gold? Where's the gold? Where's the gold? What happened when a German parliamentary group went to the New York Fed? They were told to F off. Get out of here. That was you can't it, go see your gold. That was MF Global time too, wasn't it? Another, another gold, gold heist. Yeah. But in 2014, the voice told me, Jim, we got, I got an interesting rehypothecation story to tell you. Uh, apparently the Bushes, with their stolen gold, and, and believe me when I say they've got the lion's share of Fort Knox stolen. Now, you could say stolen, you could say 0% gold carry trade, you know, the 0%. Why, why did Reuben put 0% on gold leasing? So they could lease it and rob it and use it as their profit and take it, you know, take their profit from the gold, uh, from, from the treasury bond futures trading. You know, they, they drove down the interest, interest rates from 11 and 12 percent down to six and five. Huge, huge profits. They took their profits in gold after leasing it for zero. OK, so the Bushes had their gold, regardless of where it all came from. I don't care about the origin sometime, <clears throat> whether it's Libya or Fort Knox. It doesn't matter to me. The Bushes own a tremendous amount of gold, and apparently a large amount of it was rehypothecated <laughs> from some of these, in particular, two gold vaults. And the gold vaults 
decided, well, we need to get some gold available because we've got some Hong Kong and Chinese buyers and we don't have enough, so let's rehypothecate this whole batch over here. And later they determined, oh my gosh, it's Bush family gold. The vaults themselves did this? I mean, who, who, who rehypothecated the gold and, and are they dead Owners now? Owners of the vaults. Owners, Owners of, the vaults. of the vaults and the markets in charge of the contracts. And did they rob the bushes unbeknownst to themselves? I mean, did they unknowingly? Yes. Okay. Yes. They determined later, oh my gosh. Oops. We rehypothecated bush gold. I hope we don't all get killed. Wow. <clears throat> but there's more to this elite gold. I mean, we talk about the elite doing things intentionally because they can then rescue the day and, and be heroes. A lot of this gold has been used. It's not just gold, but narcotics. They've been used. And, and a very big expense is two things. And I know this is going to sound a little woo-woo, but I don't care. What I usually find is that if you let six or 18 months pass, you'll see that I'm on the right track. Mm -hmm. And 18 months ago, it might have been Satanists. Yep. Now that's in the news. Yep. <clears throat> but here's what they bought. The elite have been very busy in the last several years building underground cities. And if you think that Virginia earthquake that occurred in late 2011 was really an earthquake, then you're a dumb shit. Mm -hmm. That was a collapsed Virginia underground city. And your hint was that the Tidewater Tide baseball team had to suspend their game for 30 minutes because they had a constant 50 mile an hour wind in one direction. Wow. That's that is not a consequence of an earthquake. Holy cow. That, that, that's a consequence of, of what, an explosion or of, a, of an implosion of, of air leaving yep. a, a cave? And yep. Yes, air leaving a cave and causing a very severe backdraft. Holy cow. There was another underground city detonated, and it was uh, north of New York City and just a few months ago. And these would be detonated, uh, if these were built by the elites, then we're hoping that uh, these are good forces blowing these up? These are white hats, maybe? Or, or... Yeah, I, I keep hearing that it's the white dragon white hats. Mm -hmm. The white dragons are doing a lot of cleanup, and the, the voice had a name for that two years ago. Mm -hmm. He said there's a group that's called the Gardeners. Mm -hmm. They're at least 200 strong, and they're going to be very busy. Just cleaning up. Cleaning up, eliminating mid-level Rothschild, Bush, and Rockefeller players. Man, I, I, I mean, okay. how can You're I You're not going to hear about it in the news, Will. Yeah. You're not going to read the New York Times and say, oh, of, my gosh. Of course not. <laughs> three, three Rothschilds who didn't have the name of Rothschild mm -hmm. are all dead right. with car accidents or they jumped out of a window. Oh, where do I find <clears> this, this data, though? Because I want to celebrate it and pop a bottle of freaking champagne every time. I mean, right. my wife gives me a hard time. Look, you shouldn't wish, you know, harm on people when I say, you know, why do we not have some, how come Soros hasn't just been sniped? I mean, you know, and something like that, you know, but. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. But we might get some good news soon when Bill Clinton dies of AIDS. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, hear he's, I hear he's in the hospital now. You, you mentioned a microbe in his body, I think it was earlier. Um, well, you know, when, when you do so many underage kids and middle-aged kids and you rape them oh, man. when you do so many i mean i think it puts to shame magic johnson and his 2000 figure oh gosh this stuff just it's 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 <clears throat> that stomach stomach curling when you, I, I saw a picture when, of him recently jim and he when this whole spirit cooking stuff came <clears throat> out somebody circled yeah. a picture of him uh and, and, they, and the caption was oh bill before he has his you know his his spirit uh, beverage to uplift him in the morning uh he looked Dude, he looked demonic. I mean, he looked like he was on a deathbed. I mean, it looked bad. He looked really rough. Yeah, well, I hear he's got very poor control, motor control of all of his lower mouth jaw muscles. Mm. Like he drools 
He's licking his lips. I, I mean, I had a neighbor. One I had a neighbor when I was a teenager, and he was always licking his chops. And we used to say, oh, come on, look at that, Mr. McIntyre. He's just he's licking his lips all day long. I mean, we made fun of him. Mm -hmm. That's Bill Clinton now. And I'm what? hearing he's in the hospital. Can't confirm mm -hmm. anything. But I've been told, not just by Ben Fulford. I'm you know, reading Ben Fulford. I don't have any relationship with him. I've been told by at least five different sources. I don't want to name them. That Bill is dying. Mm -hmm. And here's my theory. Once he goes, they're going to shut down the Clinton Foundation and you're going to see Hillary dead. And they're going to try to create a flashpoint to shut this down on the exposure to elite, powerful people. Mm -hmm. Because they don't want the exposure and they can do something about it. They can make sure Hillary stops breathing. So it's these are still these are still do. bad guys that don't want to be exposed that are close to the Clinton Foundation that are snubbing out the, the the Clintons and we've got even a couple of questions that came up from folks I think Mark Herzog brought it up uh, to, to this effect. Um, but it does not mean that they're going to clean up the evil and we're going to be left with good. Mm -hmm. No, they're going to clean up certain elements of evil right. and we're going to be left with different elements of evil. New evil, yeah. New, new younger, healthier evil that's, that's not uh, screwing up their, their agenda, right? Maybe that can coexist better with modern society and allow it to thrive without being incredible parasites. But look, look at it this way. This is a much simpler perspective. If the... Western elite have forced upon them the gold standard, all their work, all their lives, all their wealth, all their power changes. Mm -hmm. I don't say is eliminated. I say changes. Right. <clears throat> the voice is adamant. He said, you're going to see the, the, the wealthy, the elite lose well over half their wealth. Mm -hmm. And they're going to have to adapt to the new standard of, of gold. And now, Jim, let me, if I can interject, I would assume a lot of these Rothschilds, these, these assholes have plenty of gold, but the, the, the p p percentage of it in their current net worth in this fictional uh, digital paradigm is very small. In other words, their, their equity in, uh, in, you know, in, in finance and in all these companies and all these digital blips and debt and all this crap is much, much greater than, uh, than their gold hoarding, even if it were to go up fivefold. Under a new yeah, paradigm. but, but let, let me just give you some figures, and I, I'm going to have to call this quits. I've got something coming up here soon. Yep. Um, let me just cite some figures. Fort Knox was worth about half a trillion dollars. <clears throat> okay, that's, that's 8,000 tons or more, okay? Mm -hmm. So 10,000 tons, roughly, just, just rough figures, rough figures, is worth maybe 2,000, I'm sorry, two-thirds of, of a trillion, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, that's a lot of money. The Bushes five years ago were worth $5 trillion just from their narcotics. Wow. I mean, you know, people just don't do this kind of math. They've had 30 years of narcotics since Vietnam, 40 in fact. They've had over 10 years of just Afghanistan where the U.S. government covers their costs and they sell – 800 billion to 1.2 trillion dollars worth of heroin in the distributed distributed networks of heroin across the world mm -hmm. through the NATO bases. Much of which right back to our streets here in the U.S. And I personally, I mean, how many of us, especially in the last decade, have had this strike close to home? I have a cousin who died at the age of you know, 24, uh, 25 from this from this crap uh, a year ago, two years ago. Yeah, you know, I have a cousin who had a, a near suicide event over heroin methadone. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Not a cousin, I'm sorry, nef niece, niece. Um, I don't want to get into details, but uh, niece. So what I hear over and over again, including from some clients, is that the street cost of heroin nowadays is 10 times less than in the late 90s. Yeah, and the availability, can you imagine? I mean, I, you know, when I was a 15, 16, 17-year-old punk kid just trying to trying to get – you know, I can't imagine if that crap was around. I mean, jeez. Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, okay. We, we can thank the Bushes for this, mm -hmm. and they might try um, They might try to retain power by providing gold. But I think it's largely spent. 
And when they talk about deep storage gold now, <clears throat> I'm hearing over and over again, <clears throat> pardon me, that the, uh, the Grand Canyon is part of the deep storage gold. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, they'll extend the Grand Canyon borders so it's under Park Service control. Right. Because there have been another discovery very near the canyon, so they extend the borders for what cannot be mined and what is retained as deep storage gold. And this is all un unmined, you know, veins right. of gold. These are not bars right. stored in an underground vault. Right. right. I think China is eventually going to go into production on the periphery. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Hmm. Wow. Well, buddy, I know you got something upcoming. Uh, it's been fantastic, as always. Our friends, uh, our listeners, thank you for the questions. Uh, these were fantastic. It actually caused Jim and I to not have to do as much uh, preliminary uh, preliminary work. We just winged it today. So um, hope you guys enjoyed it, Jim. Man, it's always a pleasure. Uh, if you got anything else to add, of course, you will have links to your website, goldenjackass.com. And you guys, should, if, you, if you're not familiar with Jim's work, it's uh, prescient. It's, it's fantastic. I mean, his, his forecast going back how many years now, Jim? A decade and a half? Twelve. Twelve and a half years. Mm -hmm. Twelve and a half years, uh, and his forecasts. I mean, what what are you at now? Nineteen for twenty two or something? He he he's, he's uh, called a lot. <laughs> no, it's it's a lot more than that. It's it's more like about thirty correct foreca forecasts and a couple wrong ones. But as the voice likes to say, it's not a wrong forecast. It just hasn't happened yet. It's, it's taking just, time. It, exactly. Yep. It's just young. Well, like like the coming of the Nordic gold back euro. Mm -hmm. The Germans, Dutch, and Austrians, with maybe a Scandinavian country in there, like who knows, uh, coming out with a new euro to cut off the South. Mm -hmm. Okay, so far it looks like a wrong forecast. But I think it's coming slowly into view. The Germans are not going to let Italy take down the Southern European nations, cause a sovereign debt default, and, and just... Germany just says, well, okay, well, bad things happen. No, they're going to cut them off, mm -hmm. create a new currency, and do the best they can to isolate them and create a firewall. And all the Nordics, will, all the Scandinavians, they'll all follow. Yeah, and, and Italy will come up with a new lira currency that's not gold-backed, and five years from now will lose 90% of its value. Mm -hmm. Germany doesn't want to be anywhere near that. And the irony is that if Italy does that... Their cars are going to compete very well versus the German cars. <laughs> I mean, we, that's the nature of a devaluation for a currency. If suddenly the, the Italian Fiat, and what other car are they? I, I don't care about Lamborghinis and Maseratis. They've got the Fiat. They've got, they got a couple little cars in addition to the Fiat. Okay, they're going to be cheaper. So people are going to consider the, the best Fiat car for a purchase. No, no pun intended on the name there either. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I don't know. The, the meaning in Italian of fiat is a little different. I, I don't know the origin. It could be an acronym, F-I-A-T. I don't know. I don't know. We'll, <clears throat> we'll leave that to our, our Google friends. Oh, let someone email it to me. Yeah, that, that's always rich. I get a lot of very nice, generous thoughts and shared information from email from my contact us, and I I'm always grateful to people for that because yeah. it's helpful. It's no, it, helpful. It's evident. I mean, this is the first time we've opened up the interview for for quest, for questions. We, you know, we sent out an email last week and and I've I've gotten I don't know 50 plus. I mean, but but uh, Jim and I have four pages of them here in front of us and and they're they're all really good. Uh so yeah, I mean, it's it, everybody out there in their own walk of life in their own industry and in their own profession sees stuff. Uh, and, and sharing that, you know, your, your, your switchboard has been proof of that. Uh, you know, you being able to put together all those little, little stories here and there that, uh, that, that tell the bigger picture on, on whatever it is we're trying to, we're trying to talk about, <clears throat> but man, it's I'm always, I'm always grateful for other information. One of the nicest compliments, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> one of the nicest compliments I ever got in my professional life, which, which spanned 23 years only. In, in industry was, Jim, we really appreciate when you don't know something, you let us know rather than fake it. Mm -hmm. We don't get into a bigger problem because of an error moving in the direction of a fake. You always get back to us 
you always seem to come up with the answer, even if it means going to a higher power. Oh, gosh, one time I, I appealed to a, an ex-digital uh, colleague of mine when I was at Staples, and he gave me the Kratoff iteration toward um, how do I make forecasts at the product level that match up perfectly with the forecasts at the store level, breaking it down. Uh, a deeper level of forecast that, that matched everything on a higher level. So that was a Kratoff iteration. I didn't know how to do it. I said, look, Alan, I, I don't know. I, I'm, give, me, give me a few days to research this. Give me, give me some time to find. I loved the compliment that I was an honest broker of statistical analysis. Yeah, that's a great, I, uh, that's a great I, nomenclature for you. I, I try to do the same thing with, with this gold and currency world and banking and economies. Mm -hmm. If I don't know something, I'll say I don't know. I'm going to look into it more. And you know, one, one of the things that I'm really grateful for regarding my team, I didn't know much about bank derivatives. And uh, I, I, I did a little trade with Rob Kirby. I helped him with one particular thing, and he helped me to understand bank derivatives. So now I know a little bit more about bank derivatives. Mm -hmm. I went back to him last December and said, Please help me to understand the reverse repo. And I actually had it backwards. <laughs> but he helped me understand the reverse repo. I had repo. I was calling repo reverse repo. No, repo was repurchase. They were doing reverse repurchase. Synergy. Anyway, Synergy, my good man. Synergy. Well, teamwork. Yes. Synergy, teamwork. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of Gray's, the psychologist, Gray's emotional IQ. That whole theory that you're not as successful as your intelligence. You're as successful as the group that you can draw intelligence from and use. Mm -hmm. So I, I built – this is my credit. I built a team of about nine guys. It's the jackass staff of colleagues. They're smart as hell. Every one of them has got a niche. We're an eclectic bunch. We're mostly Americans, but there are a couple of Europeans and another – well, three or four – two or three Europeans – but uh, I, I try to build a team, and sometimes I say, I, I don't know, I don't know. I'm going to throw something out. I need to understand this better. I don't, I don't say, hey, look, I should know this. Let me fake it. Mm -hmm. No. Let me throw this out. Let's see, see what you guys can improve upon, and I'll give you credit. And, and your arrives is the funniest one. He said, Jim, take it as your own. <laughs> I said, why? And he said, I don't want all the attention. You, you take it. I said, oh, you don't want the flack in case there's a problem for being right in a very dangerous area. And he said, yeah, kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't, I don't mind the danger. I, I know what areas to stay away from for the danger. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're mostly details for, say, ISIS and narcotics through the banking and the secondary channels. Those are the most dangerous areas. That's what gets you killed. And, and it appears lately that the inner channels of the Clinton Foundation, that will get you killed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know anything about them. I don't want to know anything about them. And whenever any, like, anything like that is offered to me, I say, I'm not interested. Thanks. Yeah. Jim, I'd, <clears throat> like, I'd like to end with this uh, statement from uh, – this was an article that Brandon Smith, I'll, I'll put it up, wrote on um, Alt Market, and it's uh, fantastic. He ends it with this. Recognize and take solace that though we live in dark times and evil men roam free, we are also here. We are the proper response to evil, and we have been placed here at this time for a reason. Call it fate, call it destiny, call it coincidence, call it God, call it whatever you want. But the answer to evil is us. And with that, he's of course referring to the alternative media um, and, and I would, I mean, you know, he, he's, that statement speaks very true to you, Jim, and what you do. And uh, not, to, not to, you know, blow your whistle anymore or toot your horn, but, man, we really do appreciate you. And, uh, and all the work that you and your team does and all this information that you guys put out there. Um, so, and I, I, am, I am grateful and thankful that I can be a microphone, uh, you know, to, to help you get the message out to, to our friends as well. So, God bless you, brother. Keep it up. Well, I do a lot of work, Will. I admit that. But I give a lot of credit to a, a few different groups, my colleagues, for chewing things properly in the analysis and coming up with the right conclusions. It's very difficult to fool nine smart guys. Mm -hmm. 
and just keep that in mind. That's very hard to do. Yep. One or two of us might get fooled, and we're brought in line by someone like The Voice or Euroraj. Euroraj is a very brilliant guy. Uh, London Paul is a very brilliant guy. Rob Kirby, very brilliant guy. The rest of us, we're, we're at a lower level. We admit it. We're, we're not we're not high echelon intellectual types with huge connections and experience, like 20 years out there. Some of us have experience, but we're, but you know, at, at ground levels where we can see crime. Mm-hmm. Like uh, I call him George of the Jungle, George of the Comics. He he <laughs> saw a lot in in Chicago with both metals, uh, physical logistics and paper logistics like bonds currencies Mm -hmm. futures like that but uh, there's another group that i'm very grateful to and it's the news hounds Mm -hmm. there's seven of them in particular i got them on the wall and i I sometimes share back with them some things that come from my group of colleagues i share with that second level group but then there's a third group that's very large it's somewhere between 30 and 50 people who send me things Jim, you might find this interesting, mm-hmm. and often it's a story, and what do you make of this part of the story? I'm curious what you might have for a quick thought, mm-hmm. and then it, it ends up in the report with a lot more thought, and then they read about something that they introduced to my desk. Very so cool. I have, a, I have a little joke. They say, what, what, what sort of research tools do you use? And I say, I, I open my inbox. <laughs> Isn't it great? Isn't it amazing? I mean, that that piece of technology right there. I open my inbox. Well, and and it's more than that. It's organization into folders Mm -hmm. because I might finish a report and have 10 days where I'm not working quite as hard or I'm doing an interview and I'm I'm really not analyzing what's going on in India, but I put it into my certain special folder. And, And then I look at it later. I just look at that folder later and I've got 100 messages over a seven day period Mm -hmm. and that's research for the next report Mm -hmm. it's what's going on I I I I organize things I I I file things of course I got another file that's personal another file that's you know billing problems and interaction with clients and little arguments and weird stuff Many routine things, but occasionally a weird, weird item. But uh, we we got our emails and we got our organization of emails, and it can be very valuable when it comes time to writing the report. <clears throat> That's what I do. Mm-hmm. I try to make things as efficient as possible, give credit where it's due, and in Euro Raj's case, he says, "Now take it credit for yourself." <laughs> Jim, how how often are the reports coming out now? This is the hat trick letter. <clears throat> well, there, there's uh there there are a pair of reports every month. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes, rare occasion, if there's not a lot happening, it, it's a single report. But how often is there not a lot happening? Last time I sat down with one of your full reports, it was, I don't know, 50 pages, and I, I had to go you know, sit outside in the shed and, and close myself off with a cup of coffee away from the kids and you know, spend half a day. It, it, it's, it, it's an unbelievable amount of work um, that goes into it's one of deep. those. Yeah, it's very, it's very deep. deep. So on the, these the interviews of, and on your other, you know, public articles that you write, you're you're scratching the surface, really, correct, with what you're going into on the uh, on these reports. Yeah, well, there's there's another level of of detail beyond what's in our interviews for mm-hmm. the content. Uh, you can't get into much, say, for the the Indian story or like the Iran sanctions story or the UBS gold thefts. Uh, mm-hmm. You need a lot of you need a couple pages to draw out a story with a lot of logical connections and tying things together. I can tie things together at a high level here, and that's, that's not all that hard. It's, it's often a lot of fun. I, I, I enjoy the heck out of these interviews. Has the December report come out yet? No, no, okay. I'm working on it now. It's partly done. Well, with so it, much... It, it, might actually, it might actually be just one report because post-election, we're, we're still locked into the political nonsense. Yes. Yeah. There's not a great deal of financial economic activity and, and you know, new things happening. Mm-hmm. There's, there's not. I mean, we're arguing over whether Trump really should have tuned the, tuned the, the, the faces off all those press executives. We're learning about all the implications of Trump's family. We're learning <laughs> the implications of, of Trump 
not going to the press, but instead using Twitter. Should Twitter really be used for national issues and reporting? Unbelievable. Well, yeah, if, if the CNN is full of liars. Well, and, and should Twitter even be used now that we're talking about censorship? I mean, uh, the, we're, we're witnessing active censorship already take place with the Pizzagate. I mean, they're changing. Google, Twitter, they're all doing it. I mean, this this call is probably being picked up because I just said that keyword. Well, you're you're on it, so of course it's been picked up since the the beginning. But yeah, I, I never worry about that. I just try not to talk about terrorism details and narcotics details. And <laughs> if you stay away from those two, you're you're probably in good shape. That's right. But I'm also I'm not a, I'm not also asking people to you know contact me so you can set up all these hidden accounts around the world. No, I, I'm I'm not involved in all that. Right. Right. I'm involved in economics, finance, and banking, and and those are clean topics. Yep. Except when you you know have to talk about spirit cooking and and all these other things that we did as well. But that's uh, the world we live in today. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna offer them a little bit of breast milk from my my left mammary, and they can do <laughs> as they wish from it. Oh, fantastic! I, uh, I I might have to get a picture of that. Well, Jim, I uh, I don't want to keep you from your next appointment, bud. We okay, appreciate- well, it's a pleasure being on, Will, and I 